Tales from the Vault, a new Formula One programme that doesn't set out to bring you anything dramatically new. Instead, with the help of the archives, we look at modern themes and storylines and appreciate how they all have echoes of the past. Our first subject is battling teammates. Lewis Hamilton and Nico Rosberg are the modern version, but teammates have been getting stuck into each other for years. It's the first thing you think of every morning when your eyes open is going to be your teammate. Oh, and that's the through. You put me more pressure. <laughs> <laughs> Fernando is faster than you. I can go so much faster. Just let me drive fast. Negative. Negative, Nico. And the two BMWs collide with each other. Sebastian Vettel went right into the side of Mark Webber. Ralph's belated braking sets up his team's nightmare scenario. Who's going to lift to the two McLaren drivers? Neither of them do. Hamilton eventually has to. You couldn't have someone better next to you than your teammates. Now I'm going to try to push uh, Mansa out and try to win the race. Two competitive, motivated teammates, both going for the same individual prize. It's never been the easiest of arrangements, and in the mid-80s, it was PK versus Mansell at Williams that got the adrenaline pumping and the Union Jacks waving. We can tell at least half the story now as we welcome the 1992 Formula One world champion, Nigel Mansell. In the middle of the teammate wars, it's always the team manager who has to keep the peace and is never able to please everyone. Sebastian Vettel and Mark Webber had their tensions at Red Bull, but the team managed to win everything on offer, and that's to the credit of our other guests. Please welcome the team principal of Red Bull Racing, Christian Horner. <laughs> Nigel, teammates is the topic, especially yourself and Nelson Piquet. How would you define the perfect teammate? Uh, Keke Ros Rosberg, Nico's father. Um, in 85, I joined the Williams team uh, for Frank, and I joined as the number two. And uh, Keke had uh, heard lots of different things about myself, and within two or three races, he said to me, he said, Nigel, I want to apologise to you. And I said, well, what's that about? You don't have to apologise about anything. He said, he said I don't... everything I was told is not true. He said, it's fantastic. We work real well together. And I learned a lot from Keki, and uh, we had a great time in 85. So that was the perfect teammate. Christian, politician, referee, exactly how tough did the job become? Well, of course it is tough. And, you know, teammates is the wrong description of the word, because the last thing is, is that they're, they're not mates. And, uh, you know, when you sign drivers, um, you know, they've, they've got... They'll talk about team, but the reality is... There's a lot of self-interest there. They're there to do the best that they can, and uh, sometimes that's conflicted with what's, what the team's aspirations are. So you've got two really competitive guys. They both want to win. And, you know, from a team point of view, all you can do is try to support both as best you can and give them the best opportunity that you can. Yeah, we're going to concentrate on Nigel and Nelson before we come on to the modern version, but you were a teenager back in the mid-'80s when, when <laughs> Nigel was the hero of the nation. Thanks. Uh, <laughs> what, what sort of... What sort of an inspiration was he to you? Well, he was my hero. You know, he was absolutely... I had his poster on my wall. I followed every race that he, um, you know, ever did. I remember watching the first Grand Prix I watched as... Uh, I think I must have been about 10, uh, was when you went off in the Lotus at, uh, at Monte Carlo in the rain on the, on the white line there. And, uh, um, I mean, Nigel, the great thing about Nigel was he was just exciting to watch. You knew there was always going to be action. You knew that he was going to give it 110% and whatever he could get out of the car. I mean, just watching some of the replays of the, the dummy at Silverstone, you know, some of the great moves that he, that well, he exactly. made were, were phenomenal. Well, our studio audience with Ted Kravitz there, they have a contribution to make, and I wonder how many of them made their voices heard at Silverstone in 1987. And now Nigel Mansell, winning the British Grand Prix for the second year in succession, can see the chequered flag. Out he goes. Mansell has won the British Grand Prix. The British enthusiasm for Grand Prix racing has never shown more. Nigel is not going to be allowed to get back to his pit. Indeed, and we have many people in the studio for whom Nigel was also their British motorsport racing hero. And, uh, Carl, you were at Silverstone that day. Where were you watching? What were your memories of the day? Yeah, I was there at Abbey watching. I was only 15 at the time. It was probably my third race. Um, but, yeah, it was a boiling hot day. Um, and, obviously, the crowd were trying to cheer Nigel on, trying to catch Nelson up. Um, we didn't have 
big TV screens in those days. So when I've been at Abbey, the first we knew was when you came round in the lead on that lap. And of course, the whole crowd just erupted at that point. And of course, the end of the race, uh, the track invasion. But I was a bit young to join in on that one. But uh, yeah, an incredible day. Really? Your dad wasn't uh, tempted to say, go on, son, go and get a big piece of the Williams? No, no, no. <laughs> it would have looked good on the wall now, though. <laughs> OK, Mansell and Piquet, let's remind ourselves of exactly what was going on. Nigel Mansell and Nelson Piquet came together as teammates at Williams in the mid-80s and how the seeds were sown for a famous and sometimes bitter rivalry. There was the occasional win, but no big titles and plenty of big crashes as Nigel Mansell made progress through Formula 3 and Formula 2 in the late 70s. There were plenty of financial sacrifices as well, which had their reward when Colin Chapman gave him his break into Formula One with Lotus in 1980. Lotus were no longer front runners, but Mansell's superhero kind of determination shone through, not least in the heat of Dallas in 1984, pushing his car over the line to salvage a single point. Nigel Mansell's pushing, pushing in this searing heat, and surely that's too much even for him. And it is, he's fainted. In 1985, when Lotus signed Senna, Mansell joined Keke Rosberg at Williams, very much as number two to the former world champion. But by the end of the season, he was a winner, the breakthrough coming at the Grand Prix of Europe at Brands Hatch. And now he comes out of clearways and takes the chequered flag, and Nigel Mansell has won the Shell Oils Grand Prix of Europe. He is exultant, he is exuberant, and he's got every if anybody's won the race for me today, it's, it's, it's the people out there. They've just been unbelievable. I mean, on the last few laps, I could just see them. I mean, it was just extraordinary. Best feeling I've ever had in my life. He would follow this up with a win in South Africa, but for the 1986 season, the sport's newest double winner would be joined at Williams by a double world champion. And I think for sure with Nelson Piquet, twice world champion, coming to the Williams team, the team is on a definite up and everything's coming together and for Nelson I think it's a very good time to join the team. It had come as a great surprise when PK announced that he was leaving the Brabham team where he'd enjoyed so much success, becoming world champion in 1981 and 1983. And here comes Piquet, over the line goes the world champion of 1983, Nelson Piquet. But by 1985, Brabham were a declining force and Williams were emerging as strong challengers to McLaren and Ferrari and PK would be going to Williams as the clear number one. So he was number one, and as we heard, you had no great problems with that. What was your first impression of Nelson as a teammate? <laughs> Silence is golden, isn't it? <laughs> Bad as that. <laughs> Nelson was very competitive on the track, but what I uh, underrated was how competitive he was off the track. There, there would be nothing, uh, no lengths he wouldn't go to, to to better you in any way, shape or form. And a lot of that was working behind closed doors with the team or various things, or even sometimes mechanics or various things. Early on in the 1986 season, Frank Williams had his dreadful road accident and his influence in the team wasn't as great as it should have been. Did Nelson move into the, the sort of vacuum uh, that was well, created? Let, let, let's balance it. You've got to be fair to Nelson here. He, he came to the team outright number one. And when you sign contracts to be out at right number one, you want the number two driver control. And you can do that off the circuit with getting the best car, best engine, best, best mechanics and engineers to do the job. What you can't do is on the circuit, because I'm there to race. Any number two is there to race to do the best job they can for themselves to hopefully get a contract the following year. And the number two is gauged by the number one driver, if you can be close to them in qualifying or if you can out-qualify them or if you can out-race them. So, you know, to sympathise with Nelson because he was double world, or treble world, uh, double world champion at that time, to have someone like me who was totally underrated actually start out-qualifying him and out-driving him and doing some outrageous things that I did on the circuit because I was a thoroughbred racer. It wasn't a problem for me, but he didn't like it. He got irritated, didn't he? <laughs> it became, of course, an epic season. Frank Williams uh, returned to the pit lane. That came at the British Grand Prix at Brands Hatch, by which time Nigel had won three races to Nelson's one and was beginning to make a serious point to his new teammate. The race at Brands Hatch required a restart after the bad accident involving Jacques Lafitte. Nigel had suffered a differential failure on the grid, so it was an opportunity to get into the spare car that had been set up for Piquet. No problem for Nigel. 
to race a championship with uh, with somebody that is very good like Nadio and the same have the same car have the same information knows every, everything about me and know all my tricks and know what a car I'm running know my setup you know it's it's uh, it'll be very very difficult did you have any sense of Brands Hatch after the race in 1986 that you were going against some kind of team orders that you were going against your number two status I was just doing the job I was paid for. I think I think that clip there typifies what happened in the team. Was, you know, I raced back, and obviously the car was set up uh, for Nelson. Uh, he's a different size to what I am. I squeezed in the car because I was a bit quicker, and there wasn't time to change the pedals as such. The setup of the car was a bit different to mine as well, and uh, basically we had to change gear then, as you know, manually. And uh, it had the wrong gear knob on. I was really not comfortable in the car, so it took me a whole number of laps to sort of feel the car, and it had oversteer on it as opposed to my neutral. And um, I have to say, Nelson only made one mistake in the whole race. He missed a gear coming onto the main straight, which gave me the, the uh, opportunity to get past him. Uh, but he was incredibly incensed that I beat him in his car because he had two cars to choose from all weekend, which was the quicker one, and he chose then that car. So uh, I beat him in his backup car, and he didn't like that. And I, did, I didn't think I did anything wrong. I won the British Grand Prix. I was happy, exactly. but no-one else was. <laughs> and this whole thing about number one and number two status, Christian, it sounds like the easy way forward for a team, but uh, it's fraught with problems, isn't it? It is, and of course, in those days, there were things like spare cars. You know, who had called over that spare car, a number one driver? would often have the call over that car. In today's world, obviously, things are designed to be a lot more equal, but inevitably, you're always going to end up with one guy that's quicker on the circuit than the other, and no matter how you try and support it, how you try and dress that up, you know, inevitably, a team is, is, is going to be drawn to one, it's human instinct, the car that's got the best chance of winning a, winning a race. Um, but, of course, the plan is, and the objective is, to give both the guys absolutely, uh, you know, a, a, a fair and equal opportunity. Well, on that subject, two races after Brands Hatch, Nelson pitched up at Hungary with a new differential, which you knew nothing about, presumably, uh, and he lapped you. Well, we, we knew about it, but you, you changed um, the diffs from six-plate, four-plate, two-plate, but there was information through the weekend that they had tested and didn't share, and they found a, a diff that obviously was a huge advantage, which they kept under, under wraps. But it didn't happen again, I trust me, it didn't happen again. <laughs> <laughs> it was a different era. Does that astonish you that one side of the garage knows so little about what's going on on the it's, other side? It, it's interesting, because I'm, I'm guessing, I, I don't know, but I'm, I'm assuming that Frank, when he signed Nelson, he's probably written a big cheque for him. You know, he's brought him in as, as his, <laughs> as his, <laughs> as his uh, number one driver. Um, and then suddenly, you know, the number two is is doing an incredible job and, and challenging that, that number one driver. And, uh, you know, that, that must have been a heck of a headache for, for Frank to deal with. And, uh, and then, of course, the team, obviously, will then be taking positions in there as well. And, yeah. uh, you know, Nigel wasn't doing the job that he supposed to, was supposed to be doing. And it all starts to spiral out of control. Well, despite that result in Hungary, Nigel was to respond with an equally dominant win in Portugal and led the championship right through to that last round in Adelaide, a third-place finish would have made him world champion, but as we all know, it wasn't to be. So Piquet leads the race, but third place is good enough for Mansell. Mansell can now afford to slow right down and just finish. Hey, look at that! Out that, and colossally, that's Mansell! That is Nigel Mansell, and the car absolutely shattered. He's fighting for control, and you can see what's happened. Mansell is out of the race. Now, this could change and will change the World Championship. What an absolute tragedy for Mansell. Uh, you can look back at the screen now, Nigel, it's over. But um, as you that. reflect on that, <laughs> on the 1986 season, is there a sense in which the battle between you and Nelson cost the team the Drivers' Championship? No, I mean, the, uh, this is how it really happened. I was calling into, uh, on the radio to the pit saying, look, I should stop, stop. Um, Nelson had previously stopped. Goodyear had inspected the tyres and said, uh, there's no wear issue, there's no problem at all, you know, stay out. Um, Patrick uh, also said stay out because there's more of a risk coming in in those days of coming and having a wheel jam or wheel nut jam and, and obviously you spend a lot of time in the pits. And I wasn't pushing too hard either. I had Stephanie Hansen behind by 40-something seconds and I was just following Prost. 
and so they persuaded me to stay out. I didn't have any handling problems, any grip problems. And then, needless to say, literally a couple of laps later, the tyre exploded. So I did want to come into the pits to change, um, but I was persuaded not to. Um, and then I lost the championship twice. I didn't lose it once. And I think it's an interesting phenomenon, this, because um, obviously I lost the championship by one point. Um, and Jean-Marie forced me to go to the prize giving in Paris at the end of that year, put on a, a special a presentation and trophy for me to be runner-up, which I didn't appreciate, but he said if I didn't go, he'd find me another 150,000. So I actually went to the presentation. And then I sat next to Bertie Martin, a clerk of the course of the Australian Grand Prix, and he said, terribly sorry, Nigel, what happened? I said, uh, uh. he said, we know what happened if you'd hit the wall. And I'm looking at him going, I don't really want to think about it. Maybe broken legs or, you know, maybe even more seriously. He said, no, well, basically, in short, uh, the race had gone two-thirds distance. He said, if you'd have stayed on the circuit and the debris would have stopped the race, red flagged it, and you'd be world champion. Mm. So the moral of the story, ladies and gentlemen, when you're having an accident at 200 miles an hour, <laughs> get the rule book out and have a look at the rule book. <laughs> <laughs> because next time, if I'm ever in that position, I'll be... <laughs> I think we all remember where we were when that happened. Ted, have you got any thoughts from the audience? Indeed, Steve. Plenty of us uh, watching on television. Ian, you were, you were one of those people. Something's always... Stayed in your mind a question you've wanted to ask? Uh, yeah, I think like the rest of the nation, we actually got up, Nigel, to watch you on that one. What was your initial thoughts and did it change after PK came in for a precautionary stop? Did your mindset change after that? I think it was so hard. When you work your whole life to achieve to be top of the world in anything, um, you know, to have that just taken away with a few laps to go, knowing full well you're almost twiddling your thumbs, but I can remember exactly what happened because when we were slipstreaming the Ligier down the straight, I just touched the overtake boost just to get the initial thrust out the corner and we topped over 200 miles an hour. And then it was like a bomb going off. And um, in truth, I probably didn't come to from that experience till January, February the following year. I had a lot of great people uh, who sort of tried to support me and say the right things, but I had a lot of detractors telling me to retire. I'll never have an opportunity again. So you just go totally numb. You're just such in such shock to lose a world championship and not forgetting I'd been runner-up as well before then. It was just amazing. Christian, I don't know whether you were thinking as a potential team manager in 1986, but if you put yourself in Williams' position out there, how much of a consolation would it have been to have won the Constructors' Championship? Drivers' title is something that the drivers look after themselves. Absolutely. Constructors' Championship is the priority for the team. And this is where sometimes you end up conflicted because, you know, what's sometimes right for the team isn't always right, perhaps, for an individual driver. Yes, that's the debate we're going to explore. Uh, but Williams were con uh, champion constructors in 86, and they would be again in 1987. But this was a strange season in which Nigel had eight pole positions and six victories, but Piquet took the title. It all finished with this crash in qualifying for the penultimate race in Japan. PK was world champion, Mansell's season was finished, and it could have put paid to a whole lot more. Was there any sense that, that Nelson PK got to you during the course of that season, that events off the track were, were putting too much pressure on you? No, I don't think so. Pressure is what you put on yourself. A lot of people can use that as a positive or a negative. I've always used it as a positive. I've always turned or tried to bad situations into the most positive situation can be. If you're a thoroughbred sportsman and not a, a politician, you do that. You get the best out of everything you possibly can. So I didn't have a problem with that. Uh, the problem I had there is I just got a little bit wide and, and unfortunately when it landed, because obviously we didn't have the safety back then as they do now, uh, you can drive off the circuit now and just come straight back on. <laughs> I landed half on a kerb and not, and I had about 76 G up the spine and it just crushed my spine. The high point of 1987 was that victory at Silverstone, the dramatic fashion in which you, you reeled Nelson in. How much of um, a personally satisfying moment was that? Well, well, again, I mean, a lot of race car drivers go deaf. I, I went deaf during that race because after I started to catch him, when I made the pit stop, they were saying to slow down. Then I was running out of fuel and they said I was going to run out of fuel. And then the radio was coming in intermittent and all the rest of it. Then I was getting the board hung out, but I couldn't see that because I was concentrating. But, you know, it's a home Grand Prix, you know, and I know I was number two, but I wanted to win the British Grand Prix and I make 
I make no apologies now. I did it for the fans, I did it for myself. And yes, I was told officially to stay number two and, and finish behind Nelson, but it would have spoiled a hell of a good race. And I think everybody here would agree it was one of the greatest races that there, there was. And uh, Nelson did everything he could to keep me behind, but it was a British Grand Prix and uh, I wanted to win it. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it caused me problems after the race. I mean, I came back and there was only a few people that said, well done. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I'd gone back to the wrong team. <laughs> you will become world champion eventually. But how does all that compare to the modern teammate rivalries such as Vettel and Weber in the age of social media and multi-21? And we'll also have everyone's thoughts on the ultimate Formula One rivalry as well. Ayrton has, for the first time in his career, the, the car able to be world champion. And uh, he does not want to let uh, his chance, I mean, going away. That's normal, and uh, he's going to what push on. What about you? What about you? Uh, it's a little bit different. <laughs> little bit, I don't, so you're going to let it, no. let it go? I have a little bit uh, more pressure than, uh, I mean, you put me more pressure. <laughs> <laughs> And welcome back to Tales from the Vault, in which we're looking at how much Formula One has changed in the last 30 years and how much it has remained the same. The topic is teammate rivalries. And before the break, we were examining the volatile combination of Mansell and Piquet at Williams in the mid-80s with our studio guest, Nigel Mansell. In modern times, it's Rosberg and Hamilton at Mercedes generating the tension and doing their best to avoid controversy as they turn the Drivers' Championship into a bit of a private battle. But in recent years, our other studio guest, Christian Horner, had the responsibility of keeping the peace between his two highly motivated drivers at Red Bull, Sebastian Vettel and Mark Webber. And it wasn't always easy. In 2010, Red Bull was the team to beat. By the time the Turkish Grand Prix came round, Vettel had one victory to Webber's two, and both were tied in the World Championship. The pressure between the drivers was mounting, and it came to a head during the race. Vettel have come together, it's Vettel going out, Weber going out. What was going on there? Despite the clash, Red Bull said the drivers could race freely, but in the next race in Canada, Weber was told to hold station because Vettel's car was ailing and a battle could jeopardize valuable team points. Then came Silverstone, where a new and improved front wing was taken off Weber's car and given to Vettel for qualifying as he was ahead in the championship. Weber was livid and focused his anger on winning the race. There is the checkered flag for Mark Weber. Top player for number two driver. Excuse me. Weber would lead the championship later in the year, but it was Vettel who would win the crown in Abu Dhabi. The next two seasons brought less drama as Vettel gained the upper hand in the team. Some feathers were ruffled in Silverstone in 2011, though, when Weber defied team orders to race Vettel for second place, ultimately losing out to the German. I wonder what's going on on the Red Bull pit wall. We know what's going on on the racetrack. They are fighting for it. But what happened in the title decider in Brazil 2012 would stay with Vettel for a long time. It looks like he's having to lift out for uh, Mark Webber there. Vettel ultimately took the title, but he'd remember Webber's unhelpful approach. Just two races later, Malaysia 2013. Webber leads Vettel, but with worries over tyre wear, fuel consumption and reliability, the team tell the drivers not to race. This is silly, sir, come on. The fallout was open and bitter. In the end, Seb made his own decisions today and will have protection as usual, and that's the way it goes. I think there were more than one occasions in the past where he could have held the team. Um, and he didn't. Vettel still thinking about Brazil and a challenge for Horner. There's two elements to Formula One. There's a Drivers' Championship and a Constructors' World Championship. Sebastian Vettel and Mark Webber, a rivalry for the modern era. It's all ancient history now, Christian, so you can tell us everything. Uh, <laughs> Come on. At its worst, behind the scenes, uh, how bad did it get? It had its uncomfortable moments, <laughs> for sure. I mean, what you have to remember is that you know, when uh, Sebastian came into the team in 2009, he was the young upstart, and uh, yes, he'd won a Grand Prix for Toro Rosso, but you know, Mark was the established, uh, you know, Grand Prix driver, and this, you know, was the first real opportunity for the team to run at the front with these new regulations. And you know, Sebastian came in and just, you know, set the world alight and just kept going quicker and quicker. And of course, then that creates, you know, tensions between between the drivers. And you know, Mark was the type of the character who's a, a hard, gritty you know, racer, and he would often use controversy to, one would sometimes feel, motivate himself. Um, and he, you know, he fed off that. And, uh, um, you know, of course, it had, its, it had its moments. And from a team point of view, it's uncomfortable. You've got two guys that, 
really don't like the side of each other. But they're representing... It was as bad as that, was it? Well, it, 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 had its, it really had its moments. <laughs> you know, you'd have moments in the debrief where one driver would take his earphones off because he didn't want to hear what the other was, was saying, but then would be desperate to hear what was, was actually being said. So um, you've got that rivalry, you've got that competition, but of course the team's interest is something entirely different. We just want to score 43 points um, and have the best you know, chance of success that, uh, that we can. Did you ever feel that the animosity between the two of them, uh, and it was clearly animosity, as, as you say, was jeopardising the team's position in uh, the race for constructors' points? You know, we saw that tensions ran very high between the two of them, particularly after, uh, you know, Istanbul. And then, of course, you get situations like, uh, you know, Silverstone, I think it was in 2011 there, that, uh, uh, you know, drivers start racing each other hard for second place. And... You know, you can see that potentially this is a chunk of points for the team that can go missing here. And so, of course, you know, with the history that's between the two of them, it comes down to trust at the end of the day. Do you trust them to go wheel to wheel without putting each other in the fence? And I think that was our concern at that point, was to say, well, actually, it's been a good day. We've got a lot of points for the team. Let's close the race down at this point. It doesn't say Sebastian Vettel racing on the, on the team shirt or Mark Webber racing. It says Red Bull racing. That's who we work for. That's who we represent. And it's the 650 people behind the scenes that are working day in and day out that you've got the privilege of driving their cars. And we expect you to do the best, you know, for those guys. And, and you know, in the end, they respected that. But, of course, occasionally, there is a bit of red mist, you know, that, that, that creeps in. And it must have been very difficult for Mark because, you know, this young guy's come in and he was just quick, you know, and he started winning. And then, of course, you know, that creates tension within itself, within, uh, you know, within a team environment. At what point uh, in that three-year period, if any, were you consciously favouring Sebastian over Mark? Well, at no point. You know, um, you know, they both, we get, we're at pains to give them, you know, the same opportunity. And I remember very vividly, you know, Silverstone with the front wing. And uh, uh, we had two front wings there um, that were a, a new direction. And they weren't proving really to be any quicker, but it was a new direction that Adrian wanted to, to go aerodynamically with. And uh, the one on Sebastian's car failed um, in final uh, practice before um, qualifying. And um, it was deemed that the other wing was better anyway and that, you know, Mark's engineer and Mark didn't want the wing at, at that point. So the wing was taken off his car. And as far as I was concerned, I was in a meeting with Renault. Both cars were running um, the original front wing. Adrian came to see me and said, I really want to run this front wing. Um, because I think it's great, you know, information and data for us to get a direction going forward. I don't think it's any quicker, but it's good, it's good knowledge for us. So I said, OK, well, you know, let's, let, let's do it then. Um, and because Mark hadn't shown a preference for that wing, he'd effectively taken it off the car. We said, OK, well, put it on, on Sebastian's car. And the first we knew about any tension was when he nearly smashed his glass through the table after, after qualifying. And... Um, you know, he missed out on the pole by half a tenth. And, of course, it, you know, it, it boiled over. But then on the Sunday, he came back and he drove the most phenomenal race because he was so, he was so fired up. Yeah, and, of course, you were in similar position 25 years earlier. Where did your sympathies lie with everything that was going on at Red Bull at that time? Well, I think for me, I've got to say that Red Bull, um, as with a lot of the teams, doing a fantastic job because times have changed, reliability is better. The equal number one status makes it easier. Um, and um, I, I just say that, you know, just like with Nelson, there's some sympathy, but when you have someone coming up like uh, Sebastian was, you can't slow them down, you can't control them. You say <clears throat> they're working for Red Bull, but when the driver's out on the circuit, he's risking his life, he's doing the best possible job he can for himself as a driver to give himself the best opportunity to get in another contract the following year. So, um, you know, you mustn't think too badly of the driver. And, of course, they wouldn't, if they weren't like that, they wouldn't be competitive. Ted, what's our audience thinking? Well, Steve, of course, this rivalry is still very much fresh in the memory. Plenty of questions. Uh, Richard, what's, what's your view? Yeah, my um, question is, concerns the infamous multi-21 uh, incident. With hindsight, um, is there anything you wished you could or would have done differently? Because um, all of a sudden, it looked as if drivers were calling the shots blatantly ignoring team orders and with the booing that came on later on, it must have been quite bad for Red Bull and sponsors and stuff. 
Uh, with the whole multi-21 thing, um, I knew as soon as that call made, it wasn't going to have an ounce of difference because two races earlier was the final race in, in Brazil. Um, and Sebastian was very, very upset uh, with Mark. Um, he got compromised at the start. He then obviously got sucked into the pack, spun, got some damage on the car, managed to come back through and was able to win, uh, obviously, that world championship. But, you know, he, he mentioned that after the race, but it, he was still very, very rattled, you know, by it. So when he came out and he's on a softer or newer tyre and he saw an opportunity of a victory, there wasn't anything that we could have said on the pit wall that was going to stop those guys going, going racing each other. We could try because we had our own reliability concerns and it's 43 points at the beginning of a season that, you know, you don't know how it's going to unfold. From a team perspective, you're thinking, OK, we'll bank the points. But from the driver's perspective, the only thing in Sebastian's mind was, I want to win this race. Well, let's move on to the most infamous rivalry in Formula One. When McLaren were looking for a replacement for Keke Rosberg for the 1988 season, it was Alain Prost who argued for Ayrton Senna. As far as Prost was concerned, anything was preferable to the nightmare option of the team hiring Nelson Piquet. If you want to make a strong team, take the best. Take, take the youngest, take the, the one for the future. Take Ayrton. Is it possible to be equal in the championship? No. Can only be one winner. <laughs> All smiles, but the battle lines were drawn. There was a seemingly cordial relationship at the start of 1988. They took 15 wins between them, but Senna took the title on the drop scores rule. Behind the scenes, however, there was growing suspicion and political manoeuvring. Out on the track, Senna's move on Prost at Estoril showed that all internal respect and support had disappeared. From that point on, although McLaren continued to dominate, the internal strife of the team through 1989 was ever more public and ever more obvious. Prost claimed Senna defied team orders at Imola. Prost made a fabulous start, but Senna is attacking and he's got the inside line for the corner. And Senna outbreaks Prost. The very despondent, gloomy, angry Prost. And then came the notorious and almost inevitable climax in Japan. Cross comes up to any of them. This is the opportunity that Senna's looking for. And he's going through. Out! Oh, my goodness! This is fantastic! They meet. This is what we were fearing might happen. And that means to say that Prost has won the World Championship. Alain Prost, World Champion of 1989. To be very honest, I mean, I'm quite happy to, to leave because I think it's, uh, it becomes absolutely impossible to work with Ayrton. Well, the valiant man trying to uh, keep the peace at McLaren was Ron Dennis. It needed a strong figure, and he tried to be that. After one particular bust-up over those team orders at Imola in 1989, he called a meeting with the two drivers to read the riot act and reassert his authority and control. And they started to argue almost like two petulant children really I, I mean I was looking at them thinking you know this is this behavior isn't befitting and I lost it a little bit and I ramped the pressure and they still didn't get it that you know effectively the team had to come first it they just had to understand the team had to come first we gave them equality their behavior had to be consistent with the values of the team and, um, you know, what happened, uh, well, you know, in the end I pushed so hard, I, uh, you know, I tipped them into, um, uh, you know, a very, very um, emotional state. Uh, they were, they didn't look like anything other than very frightened children at the time. I thought, right, if I ever find myself again in this position, I should be, you know, actually pushing them to a point where they actually came together as a result of the pressure would be quite a, an interesting dynamic. And it certainly, you know, it worked there, but it wasn't planned. And, and of course, then there was a big hugging afterwards. Uh, and uh, that kept things stable for a few more races. It was a nice try, but history tells us it didn't quite work for Ron Dennis. But you're a bit more of a diplomat, a conciliator behind the scenes. Is, just, is that just because of the way you are? I think ranting and raving achieves very little, you know. Um, and I think you try and present people with the facts and talk about, you know, talk about, present the facts, and then quite often enough an answer presents itself. And I think 
The most unnatural thing to tell any racing driver to do is not to race. You know, that's their DNA, that's what their, their instinct is. They want to compete, they want to go wheel to wheel. And of course, your teammate is your biggest rival. And I think that uh, it must have been tremendously difficult with two such competitive, you know, drivers with, in a team that was, you know, head and shoulders above, uh, above the rest of the teams. And um, they've only got themselves to beat. And they can, uh, you know, as the driver said, they can only be one winner. Ted, make your voice heard. Of course, Ron Dennis would also have uh, Lewis Hamilton and Fernando Alonso to contend with in 2007 to deal with. But it was a question on Senna Prost that we had uh, from Rob over here. Yeah, um, I'd like to ask Nigel, actually, uh, what his take was on it. Because, of course, this was your era. You often beat uh, Senna and beat Prost. And then went on to be uh, Alan Prost's teammate in 1990 at Ferrari. Now, I understand that uh, uh, you were friends and played golf and so on prior to that. And then... When you were teammates, it, it kind of got a little bit difficult. Uh, so I'd be interested to hear about that. Well, well there's, there's a couple of things there. When I was outright, my first time I signed an outright number one contract was 1988, which was the happiest time of my life because we had the Honda engine. And then, as you know, it's in the papers, he sold the engines to McLaren for 24 million, which then allowed <laughs> Ayrton and Allen to win umpteen more races and, and championships. That's why I went to Ferrari. I went to Ferrari as the number one driver, which was fantastic. Fairy tale beginning, winning the first race. And then you're absolutely quite right, uh, still outright number one, and they wanted to bring then the world champion to uh, the Ferrari team, so they paid Alan an awful lot of money. He had to have exclusivity, so we had um, a problem initially because I said to Ferrari, well, I'm the number one driver, how's that going to work? And Ferrari are a fantastic team, they're so honourable. So we were going to do it anyway, we want him to come. And I said, well, you've got to buy that out my contract and pay me X millions more and give me the Ferrari car and various other things. And they said, oh, OK. But then you had to respect that. They told you what they were going to do. So then Prost came then as the outright number one and I was number two again in 1990. And the only thing I can say which ended lovely, they ended up firing him and, uh, and having a good time. <laughs> we'll take a break and then reassure ourselves that Senna and Prost, Nelson Piquet and even Nigel Mansell were actually the very best of friends. That was the evidence of this famous shot from the pit wall at Estoril in 1986. What does this actually tell us? We'll explain in a couple of minutes. This is Tales from the Vault, stories from the past that shed light on the current world of Formula One. We've been explaining the rivalry, suspicion and mistrust that existed between Senna and Prost and Mansell and Piquet. And then we showed you that picture of them all in party mood on the pit wall at Estoril. Well, who was the peacemaker who could organise such a miracle? Step forward from the vaults, Bernie Eccleston, of course, yeah. who could easily have been a wedding <laughs> photographer in another life. <laughs> Although, Nigel, there seems to be a certain reluctance to get involved. How cordial was that occasion, as you remember? <laughs> <laughs> You're all knifing each other at the back. <laughs> it, was, it was an iconic moment, wasn't it? It was, uh, it was tremendous. Oh, it was good fun. I mean, it, it was a rivalry, but we could all get on occasionally. It wasn't too bad. And Bernie always had a big part to play in the driver market. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, if Bernie basically said something, you, you should do it. Yeah. <laughs> my recommendation. <laughs> One thing we haven't talked about, we talked about drivers, you know, equal number ones and challenging e each other for titles. What about the drivers who are clearly supportive? Uh, Ricardo Patrese, uh, in your case, what sort of respect did you emerge uh, well, with well, the drivers like well, that? With, with, with Ricardo, we were great teammates, and Ricardo was so funny, ladies and gentlemen. If he got upset, you, you couldn't hear what he was saying. <laughs> and he talked like that, it was just amazing. And we went to San Paolo, I think it was the first or second race, and he made his mind up I had a special car. And all credit to the Williams team, uh, and Patrick and myself, because what we did there was something very special. I didn't want a whole year having problems that I had a special car. So there's two things that happened. I went to the team and I said, look, for the next qualifying session, can Ricardo have my car and I'll have his car? Because I was almost two seconds a lap quicker. And they said, no, no, we can't do this. I said, please, I don't want to go through the year. Ricardo's come to me, he's a friend, you know, yes, he's number two in the team, but or equal number ones, whatever you want to look at it. He says, I've got, a dis I've got an unfair advantage. We actually swapped cars for the next practice session. David Brown worked, you know, and we left the settings the same. 
and within the first flying lap I did, I was one and a half seconds quicker in his car than him from qualifying before. So he straight away accepted that there was something funny going on with what I could do in that car and he couldn't. Silverstone, there was something very special too because he came up and we were talking in the motorhome and he was such a special man, Ricardo. And all I would say is I was standing there talking to Frank and Patrick and there's a hand that came between my legs and grabbed something, that's all I'll say. <laughs> And I turned around ready to obviously congratulate whoever it was. And he said, Nigel, Nigel I just had to see how big they were. <laughs> because he'd just come from the computers and I was going through two corners 70 kilometres an hour faster than he was. Just one and, hand. And, and that, was, that was amazing. Because, <laughs> but, but the fabulous thing, we had a great relationship because yeah. then he accepted it. We were great teammates. We had a great time. But he wasn't a threat, at least competitively. You would prefer a combination uh, in a team, would you, that had more of an edge to it, that was driving, two drivers driving, spurring each other forward? Absolutely. I mean, you want two guys to push each other. And I think, you know, that's the great thing, for example, about Daniel Ricciardo now. He's come into the team. He's, he's the youngster and he's, he's performing incredibly well. And that's obviously pushing Seb, you know, he's not had a, an easy run this year reliability-wise, but it's, it's a very healthy dynamic, and from a team point of view, sometimes that can be less comfortable, because a much easier dynamic is the one that potentially Ferrari had, you know, a few years ago, or even last year, they've always believed in a very much a number one driver, mm. and the second driver is there for the regulations. Yeah. And I think that, you know, it's, it's a, a, a harder dynamic on the team to have two guys that are really pushing each other but it's a better one because you get more out of everybody. You get more out of the drivers, the engineers, the team, everybody involved. Ted, where are you? Nigel, you mentioned your friendship, your rivalry with Riccardo Patrese, and uh, there's another question here regarding that. I'd just like to know, with the media coverage that we had then, it appeared to be a very nice relationship you had with Riccardo and with the team. How do you think that would stand up against today's press and, more importantly, today's social media? It was a great, great relationship and it's a super question. Is that you or me? <laughs> Hang on a second, it's Ferrari. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll be there in about three hours and we'll, we'll get it sorted. <laughs> no, I think it would, uh, would have been fantastic and I think people would have seen a different side to Formula One drivers actually enjoying and embracing the lifestyle of Formula One, just like in 85 with Keke Rosberg. I mean, Keke Rosberg was uh, every bit as good a teammate, if not better, than Ricardo because he was a past world champion. Everyone knew how purely quick and what a courageous racer that um, basically Keke was. So for me, sort of winning races with Keke and the team, it was accepted that I was obviously going quite well. Ricardo, um, sorry you wanted to come in yeah, on no, that. I, was just gonna, I, I heard a story and I just wanted you to verify, verify whether it was true or not, that the drivers used to be weighed in at the beginning of the year. Yeah. And uh, there was an official weight that was, that was given and uh, obviously Ricardo thought that he was going to come in lighter than you, but you had him beat from when you weighed in and came in a couple of kilos lighter than Ricardo. Is that, is that yeah, right? we, we, when we left, um, I took my family to America, to Florida um, uh, in the uh, late 80s, early 90s to train all through the winter because I was one of the heaviest drivers. Back then, as you probably know, the drivers and cars weren't way together, so if you're a heavy driver, you already were at a disadvantage. So Alan and uh, Ayrton, they had half a second in their pocket over me before they went out the pit lane because I was too heavy. I worked really hard and I lost about 15 pounds over the winter, which was not a normal weight for me at all. But when I weighed in, Ricardo, <laughs> being like you, I didn't believe it. And with the FIA, they demanded I got on the scale several times because he thought, <laughs> what have you chopped off to actually be this? <laughs> and he was so funny and he was on the rev limiter before the season even started. <laughs> and it was great. It was great. Good stuff. Was and uh, one last question here uh, for Christian uh, from Sam. Yeah, uh, Christian, just regarding Brazil 2012, um, was there any sort of deliberate intention from Weber to block Vettel? And did they then speak about it after the race? Very good point, Christian. I remember Sebastian saying he thought Ve Ferrari had three drivers that day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I remember, you know, Mark's move off the start line wasn't quite what we had in mind when uh, he obviously uh, put uh, Sebastian near the wall. But, um, you know, it was... It was one of those things that happened. Yeah, for sure, they spoke about it after the race. And, uh, you know, the good thing is, I think as time passes, actually the two of them will ultimately probably end up being quite good friends. It's a fascinating subject. One final thought for both of you. From all the drivers in history, what will be the dream 
team combination, Christian, first of all? Well, I'd love to put Nigel against Sebastian. The only argument there would be is who's going to get the red number five, because that's now <laughs> Sebastian's number that he's put going forward. It so. might happen yet. Nigel? I wouldn't disagree with that, but I'd put Ayrton in the mix as well with either Sebastian and Ayrton, Ayrton myself. So the three of us together would be uh, a pretty astonishing. That's a discussion for another programme. Uh, that's it from Tales from the Vault. Our thanks to Nigel Mansell and Christian Horner for their thoughts and their stories on a fascinating subject. Whatever happens throughout a Grand Prix grid, it's so often the civil war between teammates that provides the greatest challenge and excitement. Goodbye from us all. <laughs>